Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Mr. Geopolitics seminar on COP26, recognizing the role of trade and the private sector in adaptation. We'll get started now with the presentation and I'll introduce to you the speakers. Next slide, please, Ian. My name is Magnus Benzi. I'm a research fellow with the Stockholm Environment Institute, and I was a work package leader in the first phase of the Mr. Geopolitics program, and we'll hear some of the results from that um, in just a moment. Next slide, please, Ian. Today we have some great speakers for you, starting with um, Annette Mona, who will moderate today's session. Annette is from the UNFCCC Secretariat. Then we'll have Frida Lager, who is a research associate at Stockholm Environment Institute and Maria Therese Gustafsson, who is a senior lecturer at the Stockholm University. So many thanks to the organisers who have provided um, photographs of all speakers looking at least five years younger than they currently appear. So very flattering. Big thanks to the organisers for that one. Um, I'll start with just giving you a little bit of background on Mr. Geopolitics and where today's seminar came from. So the programme is looking at the intersection of changing geopolitical dynamics and environmental and climate change and changing security dynamics. And it's a partnership of leading policy institutes and universities that are based in Sweden. And we also have two international partners, uh, Adelphi from Germany and E3G from the UK. And the Mr. Geopolitics program uh, is in two phases. We've just recently started phase two. Uh, but today, and this phase two has three core themes which focus on decarbonisation, food security and sustainable oceans. But today we're hearing some of the results from the first phase of the programme and in particular drawing on a work package that was entitled Impact Pathways in a Changing Environmental and Geopolitical Context. And this looked at how changes in one part of the world affect other parts of the world through these impact pathways and it had a focus on armed conflict on human migration and the sdgs and on transboundary climate risk and climate governance so this is the background to the two research presentations that you'll hear from in a minute but the mr geopolitics program achieved more than just the research outputs Next slide, please, Ian. It was also instrumental in laying the groundwork for a new um, initiative called the Adaptation Without Borders Initiative. And this looks at how to build systemic resilience to transboundary climate risks at the global scale and how to convene dialogue and synthesize knowledge to impact decision making, planning and the implementation of adaptation at a global scale. And I think it's really important to recognise where research programmes such as this MISTRA programme also create and give, give room for the birth of, of new initiatives and stakeholder engagement um, as well as, as new research. So it's the themes around the Adaptation Without Borders programme that we'll be discussing in relation to the COP. And in particular, this COP occurs as we start to emerge from the COVID pandemic, which has focused our attention on the cascading nature of risk in a globalised system. It's shown how interdependent we all are and how what, ha what happens in one country has big implications for what happens in another. And the, the crisis has also revealed the critical role played in supply chains and, and trade by private actors and how much societal cohesion and social services ultimately depend on the role of the private sector. And this is um, an area that we'll problematize and look at in more detail in a moment. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce the next speaker, who is Annette Mona. Annette's been with the UNFCCC for about 16 years, working on adaptation, and she will also be working on the global stock take uh, in its first iteration coming up soon. Annette was awake this morning working at about 4am because for those of you who are aware, 
there are negotiations going on at the moment. And so Annette was up working for that time zone, supporting negotiations uh, at 4 a.m. So we are doubly pleased and honoured to have you with us today, Annette. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Magnus, for the very warm uh, introduction and indeed. But uh, the good news is that even though I was up very, very early, at least the results that come out of these virtual sessions are rather promising. So we've seen that parties have uh, acknowledged the seriousness of the problems are and are intent on laying the groundwork for ensuring a success later on in, in Glasgow. At the beginning of the seminar, I would like for those of you who are not that familiar with the UNFCCC process to put a little bit in context the, the transboundary risks trade in the private sector in adaptation as, as included in the climate change process and more specifically the Paris Agreement. Some of you may know that the agreement adopted in, in 2015 elevated the visibility of adaptation and recognized that it's not just a local challenge as it was perceived previously, but that in fact it has it is a global challenge with, with local, national, regional and international dimensions. And that without adaptation, we cannot protect people, people livelihoods and ecosystems. Parties also acknowledge that uh, in order to be successful, adaptation needs to follow a country driven and participatory approach. And the idea was also not to have it as standalone, but to see how it can be integrated in various environmental, but also uh, economic policies. You may also know that as part of the Paris Agreement, we established a so-called ambition cycle and it rests uh, on, on three cornerstones. One is where parties themselves take action. Uh, they implement adaptation plans, take measures, and then subsequently they report on them. And then every five years, countries will come together at a collective level and assess to what extent uh, we have addressed and been successful in reaching the goals. Many of you may be familiar with the, the temperature goal. We're seeking to limit temperature rise to well under two degrees, ideally not more than 1.5 but also we seek to enhance resilience and also provide the necessary support to developing countries. When we look at the aspects of transboundary risk trade in the private sector, there are three distinct levels and timings at which we can consider those. One, as I mentioned, the very first is planning and implementing at the national level. The second is how do we review and report on what has been done? And then finally, how do we take it up when well, we collectively review whether or not ad adaptation has been adequate and successful. When we look at the planning and implementation at the national level, parties in 2015 agreed that everyone should develop and enhance adaptation plans. And as part of them, they should also build the resilience of so socioeconomic uh, systems. One of the more one of the important processes in support of developing countries is the process to formulate and implement national adaptation plans for those developing countries also receive support. As part of the guidance, countries will assess their adaptation needs, but it was just recognized earlier that some of the transboundary risks are not adequately reflected. While countries themselves can very well um, assess there is to the agriculture sector, there is to their uh, coastal zones, they're less able to see what kind of risks they're facing from outside their borders and also to what extent some of the more trade related or private sector related aspects would feature in it. For that, uh, we have a number of uh, processes and committees. One of them is the adaptation committee, uh, 16 experts who provide advice and they will look at how can we address some of the knowledge gaps so that we have a better understanding of what needs to be done at the national level. At the same time, in the beginning, when we look at adaptation planning, it was very much government setting policies. Stakeholders were engaged to some extent, but not necessarily early on. So we've now also devised guidance in terms of better integrating the private sector early on to know 
what what are their needs knowing that the private sector is of course diverse and as such there are different motivations for engaging in, in adaptation for them for some it may just be they look for new markets and profits however for others it's the desire to re reduce their business risks and i'm really happy that we'll, we'll learn more from one particular sector later on from marie therese of course the other thing when it comes to the the national adaptation planning is as i mentioned the transboundary aspects and also trade which hasn't been really well understood and i'm looking forward to learn more from frida on that aspect how we can better integrate that to have a better understanding of course adaptation also has limits we cannot address all impacts and as such the the Paris Agreement itself also recognizes that countries need to work together to avert and minimize loss and damage arising from, from such impacts. And they agreed to share to share knowledge in that regard, knowing that even if you're faced with sea level and hurricanes, if you're a small island and you rely on tourism, it doesn't make sense to build a higher and higher seawall because uh, that will hurt you in the long run. So the question is, uh, where does adaptation end and at what point do we accept losses? And if we accept those losses, who would pay for those losses? So assuming that all countries are planning the adaptation, they're involving the private sector, what's the next step? We then look at them to review and report on their uh, action and under the Paris Agreement we have two distinct mechanisms for that. One is uh, an instrument called adaptation communication which provides the forward-looking aspect. What is, is each country trying to achieve? What are their goals? What do they want to do? What is their priority sector? And the other aspect is the so-called biannual transparency reports, meaning we're, we're looking back. What have we done? What ha have we achieved? But also, where are the gaps? Why didn't we achieve what we set out to achieve? Why didn't we implement our national adaptation policy? Was it because we didn't have sufficient resources or was it because there was a resistance from the private sector or did we have other priorities and as such could not devote sufficient resources? All of these instruments will be developed in the coming two years through various expert bodies and, and all of them rely on expert input and as such seminars like that are important to provide the necessary research to allow them to draft these expert bodies the, the necessary guidance to ensure that aspects of stakeholder engagement such as the private sector but also aspects of transboundary risks, including as they relate to trade, are adequately affect, uh, included. And then finally, as I mentioned, so countries have planned and countries have reported, but then how do we know that we're all going in the right direction and are reducing the risk? That's when the so-called global stock take comes into play. We'll have the first process is actually starting this morning we had an event where parties shared the ideas of how that process should look like. What kind of inputs do they want to consider? Inputs from researchers, inputs from the private sector, inputs from civil society, but also what kind of questions do we need to ask in terms of what are the risks we're facing and how do we want to address them? And as part of the global stock tech, we will also look at how well we have adapted collectively so we're looking how how well we're progressing towards achieving the global goal on adaptation, which seeks to enhance adaptive capacity, strengthen resilience and reduce vulnerability. So here it is important to to find ways to collate, but also aggregate the information we are receiving from the national level at a collective level. And that's where we're currently also still looking at gaps because if each country only looks at its national aspects and when we collate it, we won't get the full picture. We won't get the transboundary risks and we wouldn't get any trade related aspects. So it's, so it's important here also to provide the expert inputs. We have uh, upcoming workshops over the summer were organized by the current Chilean, but also the upcoming UK presidency to see 
what is needed? How can we ensure that the process actually provides a good overview of where we are? So as I mentioned, many of those will feed into the COP in Glasgow. There will be pointers at how we will uh, assess global progress. At the same time, Glasgow will also be important to further catalyze uh, actions at different levels. On the one hand side, we need to increase our efforts at the national level. I mentioned the national adaptation plans. Currently, we only have 20 countries who have concluded those. We need more. We also need more support, including through the Green Climate Fund. But we also need to have systems in place to address the incurred losses. And that support in that regard could look at like insurance schemes. We can have social protections. And finally, in general, what we need at the international level is also uh, further financial support for developing countries in, in terms of many countries saying that through the Global Climate Fund, Global Green Climate Fund, they do have problems of accessing resources and we need to address some of those because otherwise you may have the best laid out plans and you have wonderful reporting, but at, at the end of the day, you're not able to implement them. We will fail collectively on, on ensuring that everyone uh, is reaching the necessary levels of resilience and then in line with the sustainable development goals that no one is left behind. And with those, with this introduction, I would like to conclude at this point. And as I mentioned, we're happy to have uh, two speakers who will provide us more input on their research and will illuminate some of the aspects. And I would like to very much invite the first speaker. But before I go to the first speaker, I'd like to invite Ian to quickly run us through the house rules. Thanks very much indeed, Annette, for setting the scene so well. We're, we're blessed to have the UNFCCC actually represented in a session like this, so we, we can hear it directly. So the scene has been set and we would we will shortly hear from two research presentations from Frida and Maria Therese. And um, I encourage you all to post your questions in the Q&A function, on, which should be on the right hand side of your of your screen. Um, these questions or comments will be then uh, filtered to the speakers. So uh, please record any queries or questions that you have there. And I should have said at the beginning, apologies, this meeting is being recorded and um, it will be made available after the event on the Mr. Geopolitics website for people to catch up on or for you to go back and check your notes. So um, thank you very much to Maria Cole and Ian Coldwell for hosting this event. And I'll pass on now to Frida to give us her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Marnus. Thank you, Annette. Uh, so yeah, my name is Frida Lager. I'm a research associate at the Stockholm Environment Institute and I'm going to present to you some piece of research that we've been doing, me and Magnus actually, um, as part of this MISTRA program. Uh, so you can skip ahead, yeah. Perfect. Uh, so we call this research uh, New Risk Horizon, Sweden's Exposure to Climate Risk via International Trade. You can skip ahead again. Uh, we wanted to basically inquire into if you look at trade uh, and try to inquire, uh, understand climate risk um, for one country, uh, what can you say basically, what can you find out? And we decided to look at Sweden for a number of reasons. Uh, it's a very data rich country, uh, so if you could, um, well if you can find good information somewhere it should be here. I'm also, I'm also based in Sweden so I might, I might um, uh, refer to Sweden as here quite often through this presentation. It's a small, uh, very open economy, uh, very important expert dependent. As, as an example, a recent uh, research shows that at least one third of all Swedish jobs are dependent on expert uh, experts, um, not experts, exports directly. Uh, and more than, more than half of the food that we consume is uh, directly imported. You can skip ahead again. So I'm just going to talk you through just really briefly 
what we've done in the study, um, why, uh, what kind of the results show, um, like an overview of that and what that means for adaptation basically. So this research has um, two parts. One is assessing uh, climate risk broadly in Swedish tra trade relations and for that we use, so this is the picture on the left, for that we use three types of uh, trade data. Uh, one is national toll logs uh, representing physical flows of goods into Sweden. One is input, um, uh, input output tables, um, which is kind of monetary uh, models of, uh, uh, of imports to Sweden, inputs to Swedish sectors. And the third one is resource footprints, so land and water use embedded in Swedish consumption. And then uh, the second part of the project is we did kind of a really in-depth assessment looking at one supply chain and one commodity, uh, inquiring into Brazilian soy for Swedish consumption, uh, looking into that supply chain and really seeing if you, if you look at one specific supply chain and one commodity and one trade relation for Sweden, what can you, what can you say about climate risk? So looking into uh, climate risk in transport of Brazilian soy to Sweden, but also production of soy. So you can skip ahead again, Mia. This is first part of the results uh, for the study. So this is uh, overall trade um, dependencies for Sweden. This is imports to Sweden according to uh, national toll statistics. So you can see that Germany is really pronounced. Uh, this is share of imports to Sweden. The redder it gets, the more important the country. Uh, Europe and the Nordic countries also uh, seem very important. I can skip ahead again, Ian. Just going to uh, show you these maps because uh, they they show well kind of an overview of what kind of different type of information you get with different types of data. Uh, this is input output table, so you get a little bit uh, further into uh, second and th third tier of, of these kind of import relations uh, where you the kind of US, China and uh, smaller economies in the rest of the world are uh, seem more important. Uh, you can skip ahead again. Looking at land use, the geography changes quite a lot. Uh, Russia is, uh, stands out as very important. Uh, so does economies in Africa, but also China and uh, smaller economies in Asia and the Pacific, but also uh, really South America. And skip ahead again. And the last one here is water use, uh, but water use for Swedish consumption, where uh, we got a lot of our embedded water use from uh, China, uh, smaller economies in Asia and the Pacific, India, but also the US, Spain and the Netherlands. Let's skip ahead again. Yes, so matching this data with a uh, climate uh, vulnerability index called ND gain index. Um, for ease of uh, understanding, the green, the green uh, kind of countries represented in these circles are uh, have low domestic climate vulnerability, and the redder it gets, the more domestic, the higher the domestic climate vulnerability. So for the national toll data and the input output data in trade, um, Sweden seems to be connected to countries that are uh, fairly low in climate risk domestically. You can skip ahead. Uh, and this is the results for the land and water resource, uh, so tr uh, traded land and water resources, uh, where you see that the climate vulnerability is substantially higher if you look at this kind of data. And you can skip out again. It's a lot of clicking here. Thank you. Uh, so this is, I'm not going to go in depth with this kind of the Brazilian, this is maps of Brazil, for those of you who haven't been there or seen the map a lot. Uh, I'm not going to go in depth in this study just to show you that uh, we find it important also this kind of results show that uh, you get kind of different information if you go very in depth uh, into inquiring into uh, traded uh, climate risk. So this is a municipality scale assessment of uh, climate risk to Swedish consumption of Brazilian soy and in the top it's production risk. So uh, risk of drought and kind of globally uh, gridded crop models showing uh, changes in yield. To the bottom right, there's uh, uh, shows the transport risk from farm to port in Brazil, and the green map on the bottom left is Swedish specific uh, uh, kind of um, sorry, uh, Swedish specific uh, consumption of Brazilian soy, where it comes from exactly in Brazil. And I think the most interesting thing that we found in this study was that uh, for the supply chain, uh, the most climate risks are not as uh, associated with production risks as we often think about when we think about climate risk, but because of the way um, or the geography of Swedish 
um, con uh, consumption of Brazilian soy. Uh, it's actually uh, might be more interesting to look into transport risks in this specific case. You can skip ahead again, Ian. Uh, so just to draw a few conclusions that we found super interesting from this study is that, as I've shown you, Sweden has um, important trade links both with countries with a relatively low exposure to domestic climate risks, so the Nordics, Germany, other European countries, but also with countries that have a higher exposure to climate risks, such as Brazil, China, Russia, India, and smaller economies in Africa and Asia. And the more detailed understanding of trade relations uh, and supply chains, the larger the spread in geography uh, for a country like Sweden, that is. Uh, and also it kind of really diversify the, the climate risk exposure that you saw before. And many of these trade relations uh, are sticky uh, with quite a few uh, options for diversification. You can skip ahead again. So the last thing uh, to mention is just what does this then mean for adaptation? Yeah? So um, we basically need an uh, increased knowledge and awareness of these cross-border climate risks. They are rarely addressed in, in depth in uh, national adaptation plans, for example. Traded risks are often complex, systemic and also sticky, um, which in itself then is a call for international cooperation on adaptation to these cross-border climate risks. Uh, also addressing these risks, um, they kind of um, have new questions for for what does what does actually global uh, building global resilience mean, and what does what might adaptation spillover effects have if we adapt only in a kind of a national context, and how do we take into account these cross-border climate risks? I know I'm running to like one minute over, but that was really uh, everything from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frida. That was very enlightening. And I have to admit, I haven't came across, I haven't come across the term sticky risk yet, but uh, I like it a lot. With that, I would like to turn to our second research presentation. I would invite uh, Marie-Therese Gustafsson. She's an associate senior lecturer at the Department of Political Science at the Stockholm University. Marie-Therese, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Annette. Um, so next slide, please. So private companies have recently started to disclose information about their exposure and responses to climate risks. However, we still know little about how and with what societal consequences uh, private actors engage in adaptation. And today I will present some ongoing research on private adaptation in the mining sector. And this is a collaboration together with Lisa Delmut and Jorge Rodriguez Morales at Stockholm University. Next slide, please. So until recently, scholarly and policy debate has mainly focused on adaptation designed and implemented by public actors. However, business association, UN agencies and researcher increasingly emphasize the critical role of the private sector in adaptation governance. Especially in developing countries, the private sector is expected to provide for financial resources and develop new technologies and innovative solutions. How the pre private sector <clears throat> and in particular large national and multinational companies respond to climate risk can however have far reaching both positive and negative impact on society. Next slide please. Uh, when it comes to the mining sector, it really plays a critical role in the low carbon transition and the fulfillment of the UN 2030 ad agenda. The demands on minerals and metals are expected to grow significantly in the coming years. And mining is also a driver of greenhouse gas emission and it is often associated with grave social and environmental risks in producing sites. But mining is at the same time extremely vulnerable to climate risks and climate risks could aggravate water scarcity. Mining requires a lot of water and damage mining infrastructure. And this in turn could have serious consequences for local communities. Next slide, please. So the reserves of minerals required for the low carbon transition are often located in countries uh, identified as highly vulnerable to climate risks. The negative development outcomes of resource extraction have many times been discussed in terms of the resource curse. 
and to overcome the resource coast institutions and governance play a key role. However, many of the countries that are highly dependent on mining also suffer from poor governance and weak environmental protection. And in this map, we can see uh, climate vulnerability and mining dependence for 182 countries. And on the figure, you can see where mining dependency coincides with climate change. The size of the blue circles shows the degree of mining dependency and the color on the map indicates the vulnerability ranging from the light pink, which is represent the low vulnerability to deep purple, which indicates higher degrees of vulnerability. And this maps help us to under, identify the places where you sort of the mining dependency and climate uh, vulnerability are intersecting. Next slide, please. So, uh, as I mentioned before, the adaptation literature still tends to focus on public adaptation. And in our research, we have analyzed how private companies have responded to climate risks. Um, and we distinguish between institutional, infrastructural or community oriented responses. Often also discussed in terms of soft and hard uh, adaptation. Institutional res responses refer to the integration of climate change in the company's risk assessment and in their water governance. Infrastructural responses to what extent the companies have adapted their infrastructure to climate risks and community oriented responses to what extent they have developed responses that are primarily or partially seeks to enhance the adaptive capacity of local communities. And we have also looked to what extent um, the private adaptation responses are transparent and accountable to local communities and states. And finally, we have looked upon how uh, private adaptation is regulated in four countries uh, in which mining plays an important economic role and that are at the same time vulnerable to climate risks. So I will now present some of our key findings. Next slide, please. So here we show the adaptation responses of the mining companies. We see that institutional responses, that is the integration of climate risk in water governance and risk assessment is the most common. A little bit more than half of the companies have integrated climate risk in these procedures. 43% of the companies have made investment to adapt their infrastructure to climate change. And in contrast, only 26% of the companies have developed community oriented responses. Uh, that is the adaptation in interventions that are um, or uh, aimed at enhancing the adaptive capacity of local communities. However, only half of the about half of the companies have not developed any response at all. And three of these companies, for example, have operations in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is ranked uh, as the fifth most climate vulnerable country in the world by the ND, ND gain score. DRC has important uh, deposits of cobalt that, that will be needed for the low carbon transition. And unless companies um, handle climate risk in these areas, the intersecting impacts of mining and climate induced stressors are likely to increase the climate vulnerabilities of host communities. The next slide, please. However, it's not only important that uh, companies are addressing climate risk. It's also important that these responses are transparent and accountable to societal actors. With regard to transparency, we see that 61% of the companies disclose information about their exposure and responses to climate risks to investors. Investors e increasingly demand reliable data on the exposure and responses to climate risk. However, only 19% disclose information to local communities and to national stakeholders. And with regards to accountability, 30% of the companies sweepingly mentioned being responsible for protecting local communities from exposure to climate risk, but without actually specifying how they do this. Similarly, only 22% of the companies report that they engage in collaboration focused on adaptation with relevant actors at the local and national level, and none of the companies report that they uh, participate in national adaptation planning processes. Next slide, please. And finally, we analyzed how private adaptation was regulated in four countries highly dependent on mining and at the same time vulnerable to climate risk. We largely found that although adaptation have gained traction 
in policy debates in all countries, the integration of climate risk in key sectoral governance instruments, such as environmental impact assessments, um, water licenses, uh, closure plans of, of the mines and so on is generally weak and largely depends on voluntary measures. However, this is changing and adaptation is currently get, gaining getting relevance for instance in environmental impact assessment we see some interesting uh, development there in for instance in canada um, however more needs to be done as the existing regulatory context give companies few incentives to effectively address climate risk in a way that could help to improve societal resilience next slide so to conclude, um, uh, about half of the largest mining companies have started to engage uh, in climate adaptation. This trend is uh, mainly investor driven and focused on ensuring business resilience in the context of a changing climate. Uh, we think um, in this context that it's really important that uh, stringent regulations that are forcing or incentivizing companies to address climate risk in a way that helps to improve societal resilience is um, very important that they are developed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marie Therese, for that very interesting insight into the mining sector, looking at uh, what well, it's interesting to see the ambivalence on the one hand side they're contributing to the problem but on the other hand they're also suffering from that uh, i would now like to move to our next part in the se seminar and uh, invite you all to a panel discussion we'll have, we're fortunate to have frida marie therese and magnus on the panel I'd also like to remind you that uh, we're happy to receive your questions so please post them and then uh, Maria will ensure that they'll reach uh, the, the panelists. What I'd like to do start off is uh, by saying that all three of you referred to the need to enhance resilience, but also uh, looking at the risks that are being faced by local communities on the one hand side uh, through mining, but also through climate impacts reaching the agricultural sector and that the goods that they're importing or exporting and those that are importing them are at risk. The same, you also mentioned the importance of just, just resilience. And I would like to ask that question to Frida and Magnus, whether you could uh, illuminate a little bit more what you mean by just transition and also why does it matter? It hasn't come up in the in the negotiations or in the climate change process so far. So why, why does it matter now? And I'd like to start with Frida, please. Thank you. There's a little bit of delay on my mute button, so I hope, I hope I'm, I'm all right now. Thank you, Annette. And also, my author is really interesting to hear. Uh, yeah, and thank you for the question. Uh, I think, um, I mean, we've been, justice has been treated in like climate change debates and and also adaptation uh, for quite a while. But I think when we, when we do realize and uh, accept that we have this kind of interconnected uh, dimension of climate risk also it raises new questions on on what does justice actually mean and in co this context it also is one of the most kind of automatic replies to this uh, when you notice that okay we are so in like in the um, as in the case of Sweden and trade okay we are uh, reliant on really climate vulnerable regions what do we do uh, and so really one of the core I think is uh, one of the core reasons for why we uh, we address justice, why I think we should, we really need to address justice specifically. And this is that we, we really risk abandoning um, really already vulnerable regions if we don't, uh, or just redistributing risk uh, globally. And I think there's also, maybe um, Magnus, you want to comment on this topic of, because when you talk about the food system, for example, you don't have, uh, there's, really might not even be possible to kind of uh, to kind of diversify your supply chain in a way that uh, that really makes you less uh, less vulnerable to those risks but you you just kind of redistribute the risk globally or um, uh, sorry <laughs> or you uh, or you make uh, regions even more vulnerable because you kind of abandon 
them through uh, changing suppliers, etc. And you really do the opposite of contributing to a global uh, resilience through that. Maybe Thanks. Magnus, do you want to come in and uh, kind of uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, sure. So I think when we take a transboundary flame framing of climate risk, um, you can have effective adaptation to transboundary climate risk from one actor's perspective, but it's very harmful to another. And so one to look at the mining case that Maria Therese uh, presented in a drought um, prone region that's got water challenges, a mining company could successfully secure it, the access to water that it needs to continue its operations. And from the mining company's perspective, they've successfully adapted to that risk, but they might have done so at the expense of agriculture and livelihoods in the region where they're mining. So successful adaptation for one isn't necessarily good adaptation for everyone. It can be actually redistributing risk, like Frida said. So there's another way of looking at risk, which is if we build resilience, particularly in supply chains uh, at the production end, and we have a more more sustainable and more resilient uh, use of water in the country where the mine is presented, it can still be effective for the mining company. They might still get access to the water they need, but through a resilience building measure in that region that can build resilience for all. So taking this justice framing of adaptation is very important, including in the negotiations, where there already is a discussion about the justice dimension of mitigation and discussion about response measures to uh, compensate uh, parties who miss out uh, from um, aggressive mitigation policy. It's a UN process and it's it's good and proper that justice should also be discussed within the framework of the convention uh, in relation to adaptation and how national adaptation is planned and implemented. Thank you very much, uh, Magnus, for that very interesting perspective. It was interesting how uh, you mentioned that on, on the redistribution. And in that context, I'm interested to hear from Marie Therese how she sees the private sector contributing to resilience. Marie Therese? And you're muted. Now, now it should be fine. OK, thank you very much, Annette. Yeah, I think it's really important to get the private sector on board to improve resilience. International trade, as Frida shows, could have a huge impact on societal resilience in producing site. And we know that private adaptation funding is far from sufficient for all for addressing all the adaptation challenging in the next few years. But I think it's also important to have this more kind of critical lens that Magnus introduced that um, we know that unless the private sector adapts to climate risk, this could constitute a um, huge risk for societal resilience. Um, like the example with water, for example, if the mining companies continue to withdraw large amounts of water in areas that are um, there, where there is a lot of water scarcity, this could undermine the climate resilience of local farmers and so on. But there could also be a lot of accidents, like we see the accident with the hydropower plant in February in Him Himalaya, where over 200 people uh, died or went missing. It's a clear example where you don't need to sort of factor in climate risks in the business of, of these kind of large infrastructural projects. But so far, I think that the debate on the private sector in relation to climate governance has mainly focused on climate mitigation. And this also go for the mining sector, because now the mining sector are increasingly seen as a sort of solution to the climate crisis because of the low carbon transition. But I think it's very important to um, look more into adaptation. It's really hard to it's much harder to measure um, and it's not so much at the center of the global climate agenda. But I think it's high time that we focus more on the private sector in adaptation as well, and in particularly in the global south. And there's much that needs to be done there as well in terms of the regulatory context that needs to be uh, stringent regulations in place that ensure that um, companies um, are not able to define adaptation interventions in the way that is more like convenient for um, ensuring their business resilience, but also in a way that is coordinated with public adaptation planning that 
for instance, in certain areas, there should perhaps not be a mine or a hydropower station because it's too dangerous. And then there could be other places and this needs to be factored in, in these kind of decisions of economic activities and so on. Thank you so much, Mary Therese. And we're now also receiving lots of questions from the participants. So I would now like to to throw it back to the panel, you all mentioned uh, who should do what and why, and we looked at one, one is doing something, but it has negative effects. So when we look at if our goal is to improve overall resilience in a just way so that no one suffers, the question is who has to act and why? Is it uh, the private sector and, and uh, or is it more the national governments that uh, should put in place the stringent regulations? Or is it the, the global process that we need more signals from there? And there was a question how global institutions could bring the private sector more on board. So who has to act and why and possibly also with whom together? So I would uh, like to start with uh, Marie Therese and the private sector and then hear from Frida how she sees the, the national governments in, in that regard. Marie Therese. Yeah, I think it's uh, I mean, it's really important that the the private sector acting, but I think it's also a matter of uh, regulating the mining sector to steer uh, business behavior in a way that improves societal resilience. I think there are many um, uh, ways to uh, and I don't think that only public regulations are needed, but I think there is a need for a combination of sort of soft governance and, and public regulation. Uh, and I think in particular now, I think it's very important to have um, human, that human rights need to be fully integrated in, in climate in, in intervention, because there is a risk that all of these sort of global uh, negotiations about adaptation and about mitigations um, contribute, does not fully take into account the interests of, of local communities in the global south. So they could be uh, well intended and so on, but not fully capture all the complex adaptation needs of these communities. With regards to the regulation, I think it's um, I think that there are many interesting initiatives by the part of the private sector right now. St standard settings in the in the mining sector that we have looked closely into, they are developing their own standards about how to um, adapt the mining sector to a changing climate. They're also looking into the community aspect there, but this is not very well developed yet. But I also think that separate to the climate negotiations, and, and there is uh, obviously a big role for the national governments there to adapt to the sectoral governance, like if you look at environmental impact assessment for the mining sector, the closure plan, the water licenses, these kind of regulatory contexts in many countries, at least the four countries that we looked at, are, are still quite weak. And this kind of regulation that incentivizes um, the mining companies and other uh, companies in other sectors to act in more responsible ways needs to be in place. And also the national adaptation planning processes need to um, sort of make a better um, play a better role to, to invite the private sector and make sure that there is coordination between public and private adaptation. But just like a last reflection, I think it's very interesting, separate to the climate negotiation, we see we currently see that. Um, um, OK, so we currently see that uh, several European countries and uh, at the EU level are already adopting different types of human rights and environmental due diligence regulations. And this is up and up for possibilities to, to regulate what, what companies are doing in producing sites in terms of not contributing to undermine resilience. And I think that these are quite interesting and promising these new regulations that really could hold companies accountable in complex supply chains. Thank you so much, Mary Therese. And I thought it was very interesting how you said that uh, it would be good for the private sector to have these uh, uh, regulations. And I would like to turn to Frida in, in the trade related uh, aspect. The question is who regulates whom, especially knowing that many of those companies are transnational. Would they be regulated of the seat of origin or in where they're actually operating or more in one country? How would we 
ensure that we're not having a race to the bottom, but instead have something that profits the people rather than the shareholders at the end. So what are your thoughts on the role of the national governments? Frida, over to you. Thank you, Anat. Indeed, that's the question. Um, I think where we are at right now, first step is really uh, knowledge inventory or like awareness raising and gathering evidence and understanding how these risks really, uh, what they are and how, how they function and work, right? And what that means for, for a national government and, and ac action on a national level. Uh, so first step for most countries, I would say, is really to, to take these risks seriously, the transboundary effects of if that is via trade is that one example, but there's also transboundary effects via movement of uh, by physical flows, financial flows, movement of people, etc. Uh, so really awareness raising is one, one step and uh, really incorporating these issues into uh, the national adaptation plans and also lifting it on the kind of international agenda for this, for adaptation uh, in general. Uh, I think also that the state, the national state, like has a role when it comes to also when it comes to the private sector in supporting small and medium sized enterprises, for example, in really understanding what this this kind of risk might uh, mean for them. And really this uh, question of who who does what uh, we often frame it as kind of the risk ownership. So who has mandate to do anything about these things? Is it really the state or is it really um, big private sector uh, firms, or is it maybe also uh, a lot of the time kind of these medium sized um, enterprises? So I think we're really not to, it's, maybe it's a boring answer to your question, but I think we're really uh, also in a phase where we really need to understand the, the kind of um, uh, what's it called, not the, the arena where we're at uh, still when it comes to these risks. Thank you so much, Frida. And with that, I would like to hand over to Magnus to then say if it's if it's difficult at the national level and difficult to incentivize the, the private sector, what are the opportunities we have at the global level or even at the regional level? We saw how the EU has included transboundary risk and trade in its uh, recent adaptation strategy. What can we do at the global level to ensure that everyone will be covered? Magnus, over to you. Thanks, Annette. So in the results that Frida presented, it was clear that a country like Sweden is linked to s several other countries in other parts of the world through its trade relations. And there's no way that a country like Sweden can manage these risks on a bilateral basis with so many countries across so many different sectors and supply chains. So the option is only really to work at the global level where there's international cooperation to build resilience to the risks that face a country like Sweden via its trade profile. But fortunately, there are a lot of um, features in the global climate governance architecture that can be used. And the Paris Agreement really sets out a number of tools that can be used to address this systemic risk uh, dimension that we've talked about today. So the global goal on adaptation, as you said, is an opportunity to um, state the importance of collective action on adaptation. And so progress towards the global goal, like you said in the beginning, Annette, really needs to include this transboundary dimension. So we can we can measure the amount of climate risk in global systems like markets and whether that's increasing or being reduced through adaptation. And we can track the, the, the flow and extent of cross border risks and see are these being addressed by national adaptation. So concretely, the first global stock take should hopefully uh, include analysis provided by experts and, and also non-party stakeholders that assesses the, the state of play with transboundary climate risk. And another really important element at the global level is that all parties should contribute uh, adaptation reports, whether that's adaptation communications or summaries of what they're doing in their national adaptation plans. And that doesn't just apply to developing countries who are appealing for climate finance to implement their plans. Also, rich countries should be submitting reports uh, on their adaptation plans. And crucially, we need to move to a point where parties disclose what risks they face, what the transboundary dimension of those risks might be for others, but also to assess the impacts of their own adaptation 
at a transboundary scale. So how will national adaptation plans potentially help or even hinder other countries in their adaptation efforts? And that's where we need to reach a point where uh, NAPS and biannual transparency reports and adcoms really take a global view and assess the transboundary effects of risks and adaptation. Um, I'll leave thank it there. You, so that we can thank on. you so much, Magnus. And as you mentioned, yes, we would uh, need to work together, but also developing countries need to be supported. And one, one question posed by Lisa was, uh, to what extent international uh, institution can also work together with the private sector. And uh, to that, I would like to point out that many of the big green climate funds and the global environment facilities have uh, funds to encourage private uh, public partnerships, whereby the public would uh, cover the either the, the underlying risks or the upfront investment and then uh, the private sector would also bring an investment and then ensure that whatever project is there uh, would be uh, maintained so that there is an incentive for the private sector to engage and bring in the necessary expertise but also capital and uh, with that i would like to move from here you all mentioned what what kind of barriers we see, what kind of opportunities we know about the importance of the global stock take. Very quickly, in, in your related areas of expertise, what concrete steps would you like to see within the next five years that would really make a difference? And I'd like to start with Frida, then uh, Marie-Therese, and then finally Magnus, before we conclude things. Frida. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, so more or less concrete. Uh, I think uh, first of all, we really have to uh, address this transboundary. Sorry, I have a fly invasion in my home. Um, first of all, we really need to uh, make sure that these uh, kind of transboundary climate risks are taken up in national adaptation plans and as Magnus says, uh, also lifted on the global level. And I think, sorry, I think that's it from my side. Thank you so much. Marie-Therese, what would you like to see in the context of the private sector? Yeah, OK, very quickly. I think it's important that human rights are being ensured in private adaptation so that human rights is fully integrated in, in private adaptation responses. I also think that it's important to include the role of the private sector in adaptation in, for instance, the biannual transparency reports from the UNFCCC. And I also think it's important to step up this regulation at the domestic level to ensure that uh, the private sector are effectively integrated in national adaptation planning processes and that sectoral uh, governance instruments are um, in addressing the climate risk for the private sector. Great, thank you. And Magnus, what would be your ideal outcome at the COP in November and beyond? OK, three things at the COP26. Um, I'd like to see uh, a statement in the text that refers to transboundary climate risk. So either a party or a group of parties who explicitly acknowledge the importance of transboundary climate risk for global cooperation on adaptation. Framing is important. The second is to see um, innovation within the climate finance um, space for funding of adaptation projects that go beyond the national scale. So regional, that could be more than knowledge sharing. So addressing shared risks, either at a regional scale or financing adaptation within an international system like a market. I'd like to see that within the next three years. And um, I'd like to see new dialogues under the uh, Adaptation Without Borders initiative that bring parties from different parts of the world and non-party stakeholders together to have more um, detailed conversations about the division of labour when it comes to adapting to transboundary climate risk. Thank you so much, uh, Magnus, for clearly laying out what is needed. And I thank you all very much for this very interesting panel discussion, but also for your presentations. I think it's apparent that uh, through this, we already have a good idea of what do we need to do? We know the problems, uh, we know who should act, the private sector, the national governments and the global level. 
we, we identified some barriers and, and gaps, including lack of coordination, the coordination, but also we identified opportunities of what can be done and uh, in terms of uh, more incentivizing investors, uh, disclosing risks, but also uh, having better regulations, possibly even instigated from the global level. So I think while they, the problems are still there, we know the opportunities, we know uh, the, the possible uh, opportunities of when to act. So I think it's just a matter of, of trying to influence the, the necessary policy makers to ensure that it uh, is then fed into national but also international policies. With that, I would like to thank you very much and hand over to Maria. Yes, thank you all for, for your interesting presentations and perspectives and moderation. Thank you, Frida, Maria Therese, Magnus and Annette. And also thank you all to, to the audience that have listened and participated in, in this discussion. Very interesting. Uh, if you want to uh, know more about Mr. Geopolitics, you can visit our website or you can also follow us under the Mr. Geopolitics hashtag on Twitter. Uh, and with this, I want to bid you all then good afternoon. <laughs>